everyone and uh, welcome to our uh, virtual fintech seminar series. I'm Rina Agarwal, Vice Provost for Faculty at Georgetown and the Director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. I hope everyone has made it to almost the end of the semester and now it's time to wait and see uh, what decisions get made about the fall semester at uh, each of our institutions. The Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy, as uh, you've heard me say in the past, we provide thought leadership for global finance, and we really believe in excellence in research to impact practice and policy. In addition to our weekly FinTech seminar series, we've been doing a number of other events. I encourage you to visit our website. The recordings are there for the seminars and also for the other events that we are doing. And uh, please follow us on our uh, Twitter handle at GU Fin Policy. I want to thank our team, John Jacobs, our executive director, Alberto Rassi, associate director of the center, and Anna Cormus, assistant director of the center. This uh, series wouldn't be possible without uh, Alberto's uh, leadership. We are also grateful to our partners, uh, particularly I want to point out Ripple, uh, and uh, with their help, we've been able to bring this series together. Today, we are absolutely delighted to have Professor Amit Seru as our presenter today. Amit is the Stephen and Roberta Denning Professor of Finance, and he's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. I encourage you to raise your hand and uh, use the chat feature to ask questions, but we're going to ask you to hold up your questions until Amit has uh, finished his uh, formal presentation and uh, Alberto Rossi will moderate the questions. But please do make sure you keep yourself on mute. And again, thank you for joining us today. Amit, I'll hand this over to you. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. Uh, really a pleasure. Uh, thank you for inviting. Uh, so should I share my slides? Yeah, go ahead and share your slides. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Okay, so this... Perfect. Are you, are you seeing this? Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, thank you uh, again, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, uh, give this seminar. Uh, this is the first for this paper, virtually. Uh, and uh, uh, the paper is titled uh, Beyond the Balance Sheet Model of Banking, uh, implications for regulation and monetary policy. This is joint work with uh, Greg Buchak, who is my colleague at Stanford, and uh, Gregor Matos at Northwestern, and uh, Tomek Piskorski at Columbia. And this is really uh, a, a work that uh, has emerged from a series of things that we've been working on uh, before this. And uh, it sort of puts a lot of our thoughts uh, together uh, in a, a more concrete way than we did before. Uh, so essentially what the big picture here is going to be is to uh, try and talk about how we have thought about uh, bank regulation uh, in general and where that view comes from and then try to give you some facts uh, that have happened in the data in the last decade or so which suggests that uh, we need to broaden uh, that way of thinking about bank regulation and uh, uh, so uh, how, how to go about doing that uh, is contingent on uh, some of the things that I'll argue are quite important. Uh, what the paper will do is provide those facts and then try to come up with some of sort of a framework which puts these things together and then tries to argue that had you not put these pieces together, uh, the implications uh, of policy responses such as bank capital changes or monetary policy uh, could be quite uh, different. Uh, so let me uh, do, do what I just said. So I'll start by giving you a broad motivation and some facts uh, in the intermediation sector and then uh, uh, talk about what, what sort of framework we built, why we think it's an appropriate framework, and then talk about what the framework can deliver. Okay, so I'll try to do it relatively quickly. Uh, 
and uh, uh, the the full paper is uh, on my, on my website and I, I believe on the seminar website but uh, I'll be obviously skipping uh, a lot of details so we can go back to them in the q and a if if need be all right so uh, the starting point here is really that uh, if you think about uh, the uh, regulatory uh, framework uh, and research in banking it's focused on bank balance sheet as being uh, quite important so uh, for uh, resources that get channeled from households to uh, users of capital and the conventional thinking has been that like look look at the bank balance sheet and uh, depending on uh, what kind of policies we want to implement let's say capital requirements if we raise capital requirements we expect certain sort of responses because we expect banks to behave in a certain way and that kind of uh, uh, thinking is okay but if you look at the last uh, decade or so uh, two uh, major changes uh, have happened uh, more dramatically than than you might think and as a result uh, we argue that you need to expand the way of thinking about this especially if you want to do regulation so what do i have in mind so the first channel which uh, uh, first change that has happened is that there's been a migration to shadow bank lending and uh, this paper is going to be set in the context of uh, mortgages in the US market, uh, but many of the principles here apply to markets outside mortgages in the US and in markets outside as well. And that's something that we discuss a little bit in the paper. But here, uh, what, what I have plotted uh, on the left hand side uh, in the figure is if you look at just you know, what's happening in, in the intermediation market, this is the mortgage market, the largest credit market out there. Uh, about 10 trillion uh, uh, dollars of mortgage in stock. Uh, what is plotted here is the flow, which is originations per year. And if you look at what's the market share of entities which are not banks, uh, so we call them shadow banks just because that's the term used in the, uh, in, the in the literature and by the regulators. Uh, and uh, uh, these are entities who basically don't take deposits. Uh, that's the uh, line at which uh, uh, regulators define an entity as a shadow bank. So uh, what this is plotting is the percentage of originations uh, that have been originated by shadow banks over time. And what you see is that their share <coughs> has expanded dramatically uh, from, <coughs> from about 20, 25% after the crisis to a huge increase, 55, 60%. Uh, in some markets, even more. This is just an aggregate number. In the mortgage market, there are many segments. In some segments, even more. And uh, in our prior work, we sort of dig into details on what might be explaining this. And uh, we isolate uh, regulation as being a very important factor here. Regulation, the idea being that when banks were regulated pretty heavily uh, in various ways after the financial crisis, they retreated from some segments. and shadow banks filled in to uh, fulfill the gap. That's not all of it. A lot of it also is because some of these shadow banks have uh, uh, advanced technologies, call them fintech banks, and they tend to leverage that to their advantage and are able to outcompete the banks in some, some segments as well. So we attribute about one third of this change as being coming from technology broadly defined and then the rest as being regulation. And uh, this doesn't give you a clear picture of who is who are the entities we are talking about. So on the right hand side, you can see if you just looked at the first quarter of 2018 and asked which are the largest 10 banks out there or lenders out there who do mortgage lending, what you find is uh, you have these shadow banks who are now the prominent players and Quicken Loans is one prominent player uh, uh, that everybody sort of uh, knows about. Uh, so this is one uh, margin which I, uh, we think has changed dramatically and uh, which needs to be acknowledged. Uh, now, some work does think about this, uh, and, but the idea is that, look, okay, all this is saying is that there is some risk or activity that has moved outside banking. So if we wanted to do regulation and just thought about banks, we just need to scale whatever we are thinking about in terms of policy, and that would take care of it. And that would not be uh, an appropriate thing as will become clear uh, from what I'm going to try to show you. And part of the reason is the second uh, change that has also happened. So the usual way of thinking about banks is that, look, they take deposits and they make loans and they keep loans on the balance sheet. 
they may sell a little bit, but it's only a little bit. That's primarily their model. And then when we do policy, we sort of think in, 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 on those lines. Over the same period of time, what, what, what has happened is there is also a big reliance on selling the loans that the banks themselves do. So banks are not just retaining loans, they are also selling loans and their sale retention decision is a function of many of the things that I've already mentioned and I'll again re-emphasize. So as a result, when you are trying to do regulation, you've got to worry about these two margins. Uh, uh, one is just the competition between banks and shadow banks, which we call the shadow bank migration margin. And the other is the financing model of choice of banks, which is the bank bal balance sheet retention margin. And uh, uh, what we are going to try and argue is that both these margins are quite important. And if you want to incorporate that, not only to understand how the market is evolving, but how to do regulation, you've got to think about what's the business model of a shadow bank and a bank. You want to think about how do they compete? Uh, what markets are they competing in? And how are the business models uh, helping them compete in some markets? And in some markets, maybe they compete more versus others. And how does that happen? And then basically put all of this as the third thing in an equilibrium model so that when you are trying to make a change to something, you can look at the entire system together. So what this paper tries to do is provide some facts which try to argue that these two margins are important, that argue that the business model needs to be thought about, then takes this and puts it in a competition IO model of financial intermediation so that we can do a complete policy analysis. Uh, uh, so I am, I'm seeing uh, some chat, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for later. Uh, all right, so, all right, so uh, once we have sort of done this uh, quantitative model, what, what does it allow us to do? We can do a bunch of things, uh, but what we try to do in the paper is track three things in a quantitative way, not just qualitative way. One is aggregate lending, as everybody knows that one metric that regulators rightly or wrongly try to target is, hey, what's this going to do to aggregate lending? So we can look at that. We can look at the other element that they try to uh, uh, sort of focus on, uh, which is bank stability uh, and uh, which is how much of the activity is on the bank balance sheet. And the last thing which the model does allow us to talk about is because we have both we, our ways of thinking about supply, which is the banks and shadow banks and their interaction, but also demand, uh, which is households, we can start thinking about redistribution across different uh, demographics and different sort of income profiles of households because different policies hit to different parts of the distribution in, in very interesting ways. And if I have time, maybe I'll talk a little bit about implications outside the mortgage market, uh, but, I, but I very much doubt that we will have time, but we do talk about that in the paper. All right, so how am I gonna go about in this talk? So in the next few minutes, what I'm gonna to try to do is give you some basic facts. There are many more facts in the paper, but I'll just try to sort of emphasize to you at a bank migration margin. Here, just to remind you, the uh, distinguishing feature is going to be how traditional banks and shadow banks are competing in different parts of the market. Then I'm going to sort of show you some facts which sort of reflect the balance sheet retention margin. Uh, what's the idea here that, you know, traditional banks are not all just doing the same thing. Their business model is contingent on what's their financial health. And try to sort of argue that these two things matter for both quantities and prices in different markets. Once we have sort of motivated these facts, I'll probably also show you a little bit about that there's very interesting things on the demand side as well, household side, and then give you a broad overview of what is our model that we sort of uh, build here. Uh, talk a little bit about the demand side, talk a little bit about the financing side, and then give you some intuition for what in the data is going to discipline the model so that you have a sense of that this is not just a black box and we are just going to match some moments. Actually, there are some very interesting moments. And then hopefully I will be able to tell you a little bit about one or two maybe counterfactuals and we can talk about others that we do in the paper. Uh, but the whole idea here is uh, to show you that after we have built all this machinery, what do we get at the end? Because it's ultimately about counterfactuals. And here I'll focus on uh, aggregate lending, but in the conclusion, maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, redistribution and stability as well. All right. So the setting, like I've already told you, is residential mortgage market. Uh, given the uh, short time I have, uh, I'll just skip over uh, most of the details here, uh, except to tell you that uh, if you don't know anything about the mortgage market in the US, you want to think about two segments here. 
One is a largish segment known as the conforming market. This is a market market which is backed by government sponsored entities. What does this mean? That if you're a lender and if you satisfy a certain set of guidelines they have, they buy mortgages for you, package them and then sell it uh, to investors. This is about 50 to 60% of the loans in our sample period. And they tend to be smaller loans uh, in terms of size. So for example, one number to remember is 400,000 uh, roughly in most areas in 2010. The other segment of the market, which we are going to be focused on is the jumbo market. Uh, this is loans uh, which are in loan sizes above the conforming limit. There are other reasons too, but this is the uh, main uh, driving factor, which is uh, different. Uh, and what is uh, very important and interesting to sort of note here is that this market before the financial crisis of 2007 and eight uh, uh, used to be a vibrant market where you could sell loans to uh, private uh, banks and investment banks uh, who would then package them and sell it uh, off. But uh, post that, once the private securitization market collapsed and never really came back, this has been a very tough market to securitize uh, during our sample period. And this is going to feed into some of the things that I'm going to show you. So uh, institutional detail, I realize I'm skipping it too fast, but if there are questions later, we can get back to it. So let me give you a few motivating facts. So remember in the very first slide, I told you that, hey, look, market share of shadow banks has gone up over time. And I see some of you are saying, hey, market shares, uh, uh, why are they called shadow banks? Why not non-banks? Why not independent mortgage companies? Maybe this is just like I'm using a definition of uh, uh, the FSB and BIS, uh, uh, you know, and that's basically what they, what they sort of define these as. But these are a little bit more than in independent mortgage companies, I, I think, uh, as the Quicken loans uh, can sort of tell you about. But going back, uh, I told you that over the sample period, shadow bank market share went up. And the question is, did it go up everywhere? Remember the two segments I told you? Now here, what I'm plotting is the bank market share. And essentially what this is trying to tell you is that, hey, look, in the conforming market is where banks have really lost a huge amount of market share. If I look at the other segment, the jumbo segment, uh, uh, the segment where government is not uh, buying loans and there is no market for selling, that segment market share of banks is more or less stable. Okay, And in fact, there are other segments like the conforming market, which is the FHA, uh, which we don't talk about here, but has very similar features like the conforming market, where the market share uh, change of banks is even more dramatic. They used to be uh, pretty much uh, doing everything. And if you look now, they pretty much do 10, 20%. So that's an even bigger change. So all this is trying to say is that, look, shadow bank migration is not uniform. It seems to have some feature which is related to where uh, it's easy to sell the loans once you have originated them. If you don't like aggregate pictures in the paper, we look at more micro data. Without getting into uh, uh, gory details here, what's been plotted on the left and the right is uh, how does the market look uh, around the conforming uh, threshold? Remember I told you conforming versus jumbo is driven by a loan amount. Uh, this loan limit has changed over time, but you can normalize it to the number one. And on the left is smaller loans, on the right is uh, larger loans. Uh, larger loans are jumbo loans, smaller loans are conforming loans. So at the top, I am saying easier to securitize or hard to securitize. And what you see is that if you look at the market share picture on the left, uh, uh, banks basically uh, uh, have a much larger market share on the jumbo side of the market, which is harder to securitize. If you see the right picture, uh, what you see here is that this is related to how many loans are being retained on the balance sheet. So if you look at the conforming side, uh, uh, banks are basically retaining a very little, uh, but if you look at uh, what's happening to banks on the jumbo side, that's where they are retaining pretty much whatever is on their balance sheet. So there is shadow bank migration that is happening, but it's not uniform. It's, it, it matters a, a lot to uh, uh, where, where, this, uh, uh, where securitization is easily available. The other uh, channel that I want to sort of talk about is the bank balance sheet retention channel. So here the focus is only on banks. And what one is trying to understand is, do all banks retain uniformly or is there something else going on here? What we are trying to argue is, uh, banks basically are doing this based on their financial health. So what's plotted uh, uh, on the left-hand side is, if you look across lenders in the data, 
And if you looked at their capital ratio, which is the x-axis, and if you ask the question, hey, how much are they holding on their balance sheet uh, on the y-axis? And it, this is just basically plotting in different bins uh, uh, and uh, telling you that, look, if banks have more capital, they tend to hold more loans on their balance sheet. Uh, you might say that, well, this is just comparing wells versus city, maybe. If you don't want to sort of only focus on that. The picture on the right is trying to do that same thing within lenders. So it, what is that say, saying that within wells, as the capital ratio, again, the x-axis improves, they tend to retain more. As the capital ratio is not uh, improved, they tend to retain less. And this is a feature which is not just uh, uh, in mortgages, uh, just to give you a broader context, this is true even outside mortgages and when you look at bank balance sheet. And uh, so that tells you that banks are not just uh, uh, randomly just saying that, okay, this is my business model and everybody is going to be doing it. There is an element of financial health of banks, uh, which is related here. And ultimately, this feeds into the price and quantity. Uh, I'm not showing you quantity pictures, but they are in the paper. And what you sort of see is that if you look at jumbo mortgages, of course, the quantities of those collapsed after the uh, recession, uh, uh, last uh, financial crisis, 2007-8. And it, they, they eventually slowly came back. And here, what I have plotted are the prices. So quantity went down and then went up. Here, what am I showing you? I'm showing you the spread or the relative price difference between jumbo side and the conforming side. Remember, greater than one is jumbo, less than one is conforming. If you look, look at the left-hand side picture, it's telling you that the relative pricing uh, is pretty uh, 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 sort of, uh, different in 2008 when bank balance sheets are really, really uh, hurt. If you contrast the same picture in 2014, this is just giving you two snapshots, what you find is the relative wedge has collapsed. Uh, remember, quantities in 2008 collapsed, quantities in 2014 increased. So this is just trying to give you that, look, quantities are going down and going up as prices are, uh, relative prices are uh, uh, also moving. And they are moving in a direction which is consistent with this being a supply story rather than a demand story. Uh, though uh, you, can, you can argue that there are demand elements here happening as well. Uh, so this is mainly all on the supply side. This is not to say there's not anything interesting on the demand side that's happening. Uh, but uh, to summarize, uh, the way you want to sort of think about is that look, there are traditional banks and they have some balance sheet capacity. And what you can think about is that they are going to dominate balance sheet uh, lending as long as their capitalization is reasonable. Once they have low capitalization, they are not going to do bank balance sheet lending. They are going to do the same lending that the shadow banks do if they want to compete. And that's something that's therefore going to play a role with where banks are going to be active versus not active in terms of competing with shadow banks. Shadow banks, on the other hand, have low, low regulation because they don't take deposits. They don't get regulated as heavily. And they rely primarily on the originate to distribute market. So if you want to think in your, in your mind about the entire spectrum of supply, you want to think about shadow banks on one end who are doing originate to distribute. You want to think about the very well capitalized banks on the other extreme who are basically doing originate to distribute as they want or retain, retaining. And then you're thinking about low capitalized banks somewhere in the middle who can do both but are primarily going to be more like shadow banks than like traditional banks with well and healthy balance sheets. So that's on the supply side. On the demand side, like I said, there's a bunch of stuff, but let me just tell you a couple of things. Now, some of these things are very well established in the literature, but the reason I'm sort of telling you is that this is going to be important in how we want to think about the equilibrium. It cannot be only a supply-based equilibrium because there's a lot of action happening on the demand side as well. So what do I have here on the left-hand side? On the left-hand side, I'm just plotting distribution of loans. And here, there is a much uh, a known picture on the left-hand side that everybody knows that there is a big amount of bunching that happens at the conforming limit. And the way you want to think about it is that there is a bunch of, uh, there's a, not a bunching is not the right word again here. There, there is a number of uh, uh, borrowers here who want uh, loans above the conforming limit, because, but for various reasons uh, cannot do that. So therefore, what do they do? They bunch to the conforming limit because that's the closest they can get. They want a conforming loan but that's the closest they can get in terms of where their true uh, preferred size might be. So there's a lot of bunching going on, which means there is a lot of 
demand side preferences which we need to account for because this is not clearly happening because of all the things that I sort of told you necessarily. That's one feature of the data that we are going to be taking very seriously and trying to impose on the demand side. On the right hand side is a similar sort of picture, maybe not as well known as the left hand side picture, which is if you look at uh, the bunching, what it tells you is that there's a mass of people which is missing. What kind of people are these? Well, this is, if you look at the income profile, it's the same sort of graph, but instead of loan size, I'm plotting income now. Uh, uh, and what you see is that these are high income people uh, uh, who are moving and bunching at the threshold. Uh, otherwise, if you uh, omit this aberration, what you see is that uh, as your income increases, you tend to have a linear relationship between the size of home and uh, your income. Uh, so this is again something that we have to be used in our model. So let me now uh, sort of jump into how we put all of these facts together and uh, what we try to do in, in, the, in the, rest part, the rest of the paper. So uh, what we are going to try to argue is that if you want to do regulation, you want to appreciate the business models uh, being different of shadow banks, you want to appreciate that there is going to be a competition and industrial organization between them, which means that this is not uniform substitution or competition that's happening. And then you want to put it in an equilibrium where you can also appreciate the demand side changes that are happening or may happen. And so that's what we try to do here. So we model the demand side where we have consumers. Uh, we use the richness of our data to model them as heterogeneous consumers uh, and their preferences. Usually people have to take consumers in these models and have uh, uniform preferences across uh, different types of consumers just because they don't have enough data. We do have data. So what we are going to do is we are going to have like a random coefficient is the closest way of sort of thinking about it. Uh, and the, these preferences are going to therefore move based on demographics like income, house price, and so on. And these consumers are going to uh, have uh, you know, uh, preferences over price and non-price terms. And one feature which we introduce here, which is new, is uh, they will have a preference on what is the sort of uh, loan size they desire. Uh, why is this going to be important? This is going to be important when trying to match the bunching that I showed you, and I'll get back to it again. So there's going to be a rich demand system, and then we're going to impose on that uh, a supply uh, bringing in all the kind of things that we've either learned in the facts that I've shown you or prior work has sort of tell, told us. So in particular, the products are going to have a price feature. Uh, it'll have uh, non-price attributes. There are going to be different kind of loans, <coughs> purchase, refi, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, there's going to be differences in terms of lending uh, 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 based on what kind of financing they have. If you're a bank, there is going to be choice between balance sheet financing and securitization. If you're a shadow bank, you have only securitization that you can rely on. Uh, balance sheet uh, lending will mean that deposits uh, will allow you to have a lower cost of capital potentially, but you will be subject to capital requirements, which will then it will then depend on how far away or close you are to the capital constraints in terms of how useful or how, how much of a comparative advantage you have in doing balance sheet lending. This is to account for the fact that there is heterogeneity in uh, financial health of the banks, which should play a role in what kind of business model they pick. And finally, there is going to be a difference in regulation between banks and shadow banks. So shadow banks are not going to face regulation and uh, uh, banks are going to face regulation. Uh, this is this regulation is going to capture everything except capital requirements, which we can model more precisely uh, uh, because of the data availability. Just to uh, give you some flavor without getting into details, when I said on the demand side, it's pretty rich. What, I, what did I have in mind? This is the standard uh, BLP sort of uh, framework where we have the indirect utility function of the consumer uh, who may choose uh, a loan from lender J. Uh, and uh, what does it have? You can think about three pieces here, really. The first piece is the price uh, 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 effect, which is the higher the interest rate, the less you like the mortgage. You can look at the last piece, that's more the non-price attributes. So it has a component which is uh, related to uh, banks' uh, uh, specific uh, 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 features. This is trying to fit the argument that some people prefer Quicken or some people prefer Bank of America, regardless of anything else. Just pick, you know, we, that's how the data is. Some people prefer uh, 
certain sort of banks, could be closeness, could be prior relationships, whatever have you. And then we allow this to not only vary over time at, at the lender level, but in different markets as well. And the market here is defined at the MSA time level. And then there is a component which gives you some idiosyncratic taste as well. The element in between is where a lot of innovation is as well. And this is essentially trying to bring in this notion that you may have preference for a particular size of loan. And if you don't get that size, uh, you may have a disutility. So Beira is measuring the disutility if you're away from jumbo and your desired size was jumbo. Uh, and then the second component here is trying to measure your unconditional preference or hatred, uh, like your like or hatred for conforming loans. So you can think about, well, if it's conforming, maybe I, there is more convenience. If it's jumbo, maybe I have to do more paperwork and all of that is going to be captured in this variable. Uh, and uh, what you see is that the coefficients here have an I subscript and that's where uh, the random coefficients comes in. Uh, and this I is going to be a function of uh, the attributes uh, of uh, each individual. And we have enough data to be able to uh, look at this and then try to ask the question that do these coefficients move in ways that appear sensible to us. And I'll, I'll hopefully be able to talk a little bit about that. On the supply side, there are going to be three lenders. There's going to be traditional banks and not just shadow banks, but we are going to separate between non-fintech and fintech. This goes back to the very first slide where I told you that technology had a role to play. And in prior work, we sort of argue and show that uh, if you look at fintech versus non-fintech shadow banks, there is a difference in quality, which seems to explain the increase in market share of fintech lenders versus non-fintech lenders. So that variation has to be captured in the data. And that's why we have three types of categories here. Now, what's going to be the difference here between traditional banks and shadow banks? Like I said before, there is going to be uh, some uh, regulatory constraint, which is a function of risk-weighted assets, which we model. And that's going to be uh, something that they are going to balance uh, against the usual lower cost of deposit deposits that they might otherwise enjoy. And they're going to face regulatory costs in general relative to shadow banks. Shadow banks have access to securitization market, which banks also do. And there's a rate at which they can buy and sell. Uh, and then there are going to be different mortgage types here. There's going to be conforming loans, which can be securitized. They can be held on balance sheets too. But then the jumbo loans can be only held on balance sheet. For now, I'm going to sort of assume that in the extension of the paper, we allow securitization on the jumbo side as well, assuming that as things improve in the future, we might get there. And if it does, what does it do in terms of various counterfactuals we, we, we sort of run? How does the equilibrium work? Uh, uh, very standard, uh, consumers maximize their utility across mortgages and given the taste uh, uh, error term, uh, it's very standard with DLP, you sort of get uh, uh, a kind of market shares uh, which we can play with. There is a uh, mortgage supply where lenders are gonna be maximizing profits and uh, essentially what they're trying to do is choose interest rates and choose also the retention if they have a choice on how much to retain on the balance sheet. Uh, on the demand side, consumers are choosing mortgage size, type, and lender, and maximizing their utility across the choice set that they have. Here, I just want to mention one thing so that, like right now, that we are getting into the machinery where, uh, you know, like you can think that, hey, you know, you looked at a lot of data, you had this model, and then you try to fit some moments. Uh, what we try to do is try to bring in some extra moments, which provide some transparency, and I'll talk a little bit about that. One is we have a price instrument here, which we think is pretty interesting. So usually the usual endogeneity problem in these models is, hey, how do you get an instrument for demand or supply, depending on whichever parameter you're trying to tease out. And here we use GSC geographic pricing quirks, institutional quirks, which lead to uniform risk-based, non-risk-based pricing across markets to use as an instrument to trace out demand because price here is on the conforming side is a function of uh, just their political economy cons constraint rather than the demand side uh, feature of the market. And this is something that prior work has sort of shown. What is also interesting is that we try to look at that bunching that I showed you before, both on the quantity side and the borrower income side. And we try to match that as well when we try to fit our model. And so I'll, I'll get to that and, and show you what I mean by that. So here is, one way of sort of thinking that, okay, this is not going to be totally like a black box. Remember I showed you there was a disutility on the borrower side that we model related to whether you choose the loan, which is too small relative to whatever your preference might be. 
So let me just show you how sort of we back out that parameter. So the blue here is, let's say we model what the true desired uh, loan size might be in the population simulated. And then what you're going to see in the data is something like what I've plotted in this uh, uh, pinkish uh, picture with bunching uh, potentially somewhere. So how is that going to be useful? Uh, well, remember, this is essentially people who might have chosen uh, non-conforming jumbo loan, but had to choose conforming for various reasons. And that's the parameter beta that's uh, trying to back this out. Uh, how is it doing it? Well, we are going to use the size of the bunching to back out that parameter. What do I have in mind? That if your estimated disutility from the wrong size is such that it is low, then you're going to see a lot of bunching. If the dis estimated disutility from the wrong size is very high, you're going to see less bunching. So that's what these different sort of pictures are doing. And in the data, we have different markets. Remember I told you markets are MSA time level. So we can see this bunching across markets, across time uh, at a very uh, a high frequency in relative terms uh, to be able to back out these beta variables. And then once we have these beta variables, we can start looking at uh, how they vary with demographics and so on. Uh, the other element that I will try to sort of mention here is that if you focus on uh, the part of the uh, uh, curve here where uh, mortgages have disappeared, some of them appear as bunching and a bunch of them disappear from the market because they don't take any mortgage. They probably go to the rental market. We can model that as well. Uh, I had a parameter which was just how much do you like conforming versus jumbo. And so what that parameter is going to do is that's going to estimate after I have taken account of bunching, how much is the drop off uh, in different markets? And depending on the drop offs across markets, we can estimate that parameter as well. So I'll not sort of uh, given the paucity of time, I will not get into that uh, how we sort of try to uh, confirm that these moments are reasonable and the model does a reasonable job, except telling you that if you look at just bunching, we do a pretty good job in terms of explaining uh, given the model. Uh, we do a pretty good job in terms of market shares. Uh, and uh, in fact, we have a, a very nice experiment that uh, uh, happened in the data where limits, conforming limits were changed over time. And we can ask our model to tell us uh, out of sample what is predicted in terms of bunching and so on when the conforming limits change. And we actually hit the numbers pretty, pretty reasonably. We discussed that in the paper. The other thing which gives us confidence that we are not completely uh, uh, out there in terms of our estimates is things like you can talk about, okay, what's the price elasticity? And we are getting a price elasticity of uh, about four, which is very similar to what Defusco and, and, and uh, uh, Pesioric uh, find in their paper. And that's not all. We, we can also ask, that's the average price elasticity, but how does this vary with demographics? For example, house price. And we find that the features of price elasticity are pretty sensible. For example, price elasticity decreases with house price as you might anticipate and, and expect. Similarly, we can look at loan size, what's the mean loan size, and then how does it vary uh, in demographics uh, and, and so on. And we think that these numbers are also not completely crazy, uh, what we find. Uh, on the uh, economics, I think uh, I'll just add one uh, side here, which uh, again should convey a little bit of uh, comfort. Uh, uh, here, what I have plotted is just the financing cost and on the x-axis, the capital ratio. And I'm just trying to tell you how the market is going to interact just if you focused on the financing cost. So first, if you focus on this uh, uh, line, uh, this is the, what, the, what the data sort of roughly tells us. I mean, this is plotted as a, uh, in, in the model, but roughly in the data, this is what you sort of get. What is the rate at which uh, a loan can be sold to uh, GSEs? And this is what shadow banks rate is going to be. Uh, now, if you focus on the conforming side of the market, here, the banks have a choice. They can keep it on the balance sheet or sell it as well to GSEs. And what's going to happen is it's going to interact with capital ratio, like I told you. So if your capital ratio is pretty high, you're going to be retaining because your deposit costs are pretty low and you don't face the uh, uh, regulatory capital constraint. So it's pretty advantageous for you to do this on your balance sheet rather than sell it to, shadow bank, uh, sell it to GSEs because that's a higher rate and you're not going to do that. Unless your capital becomes pretty low and that's when you are going to do the same thing as uh, what, what the shadow bank does with GSEs. And this number is exactly the same, but I've just blown it up so that you can see. Uh, if you're on the jumbo side of the market, the only game in town here is banks. And if you look at their 
uh, 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 costs uh, or financing costs, what happens is it just varies with capital uh, uh, ratio. There is no flat portion where you can sell it to GSEs like it was with conforming. So essentially when the capital ratio is pretty healthy, I, if I want to be in jumbo, I retain them on the balance sheet. But even when my capital ratio drops, I still, uh, even though I face a very high steep financing cost, I still, uh, uh, that's the cost that I sort of should bear. Now, the interesting thing that's going to be uh, happening here is because they are the only game in town, they can pass a lot of financing costs to the consumers. That's where the demand side comes in. Why? Because consumers, when they see high prices on demands uh, on, the, on the jumbo side, have a price elasticity. And depending on whatever the price elasticity is, they are going to decide whether they're going to stay in the market, disappear, move to the uh, bunching side of conforming a, a mortgage, uh, and so on. And all of those pieces here fit in uh, pretty nicely. So like I promised, I'm going to just talk about one counterfactual because I, I, I rightly anticipated I won't have enough time and uh, I, I do want to have some Q&A so that we can discuss a few of these things. So uh, let's take the capital requirement as a counterfactual because I'll be able to sort of illustrate and talk about others within that as well. So how should we sort of think about it? Okay, so what I want you to do is focus on the right-hand side of the picture here. And uh, if you look at the baseline where we are going to start, uh, uh, with a tier uh, uh, capital ratio of 6%, okay? Now, what have I plotted here? I told you that we can look at lending volumes, we can look at how much activity is on the balance sheet, and we can look at redistribution because we have consumers that we have modeled, so we can see who is affected, who is not affected, which part of the income distribution is affected, and so on. But here, I'm just going to give you the intuition in lending volume, aggregate lending volume. So, starting point, middle, uh, right-hand side picture, the middle part of the bar graph, where... 6% is the baseline. Total lending is about, I don't know, 1.7 trillion-ish. And if you want to see, separate this out, here is how you want to sort of think about it. First, let's look at the jumbo side, which is red. This is where only banks operate, and that's what it is. Now, the rest of the market is conforming mortgage, and here it's shadow banks and banks both operating. Now, first, let's look at the gray portion. That's where shadow banks are. Shadow banks are only going to be able to sell to GSEs given their constraints and business model. And that's what sort of shows up there. As far as banks are concerned, they are not only selling to GSEs and the blue portion is split into light blue and dark blue. And if you decide to sell to GSEs, that's the dark portion. And some of them decide to retain on the balance sheet and that's the light blue portion. And that's how the entire market is split. Now, suppose I increase the capital uh, uh, const, uh, requirement to 7.5%. To what happens? Well, look at the right-hand side of this picture. First thing to notice is the aggregate lending volume doesn't move by much. Okay. So how has that happened? Well, if I look at shadow banks, well, they are still lending, uh, do, doing their uh, stuff and selling to GSEs. Not much change there. If I look at Jumbo, yeah, there's a little bit of a decline. It's expected. It's more costly to retain loans now. The cost of financing on the bank balance sheet has gone up. So it shrinks a bit, but not by a lot. But if you look at where the major change is, it's on the conforming side within the bank itself. Why? Because bank is now moving to a model like shadow banks and they are just uh, selling to GSCs. There's not much contraction in the part in the conforming market, but there's a big reallocation here. How does this look more generally? This is taking that same picture and plotting on the x-axis different scenarios, okay? And again, aggregate lending is being plotted. So the first thing to notice is look at the dotted uh, blue line, which is the focus of most of regulation out there. Hey, what's happening on bank balance sheet? And not surprisingly, as you increase the capital ratio, bank uh, amount retained on bank balance sheet sort of goes down. But that's not going to tell you anything about aggregate lending if you as a policymaker are worried about that. For that, first thing you need to do is to ask how much are banks actually selling? So if you look at the black line, which is bank balance sheet plus what they sell, you can already see that the bank balance sheet retention margin dampens the effect quite a bit, which was also evident when we went from 6 to 7.5% in the previous picture. That's not all that's going to happen to aggregate lending. Another dampening effect here is going to come from shadow banks because some of the activity is going to move to shadow banks. As banks become less competitive, they might, on the balance sheet side, they might decide either to move to jumbo side where they may or may not want to expand as much or decide to just do what the shadow banks are doing uh, 
And because they face regulatory costs, everything else the same, they are not going to be as competitive and shadow banks are going to be winning uh, some of the market share there. But it's not going to be fully compensating for the drop in lending if you increase the capital ratio quite a bit. Bottom line here is that the balance sheet margin and shadow bank margin are both important and seem to operate in the same way here. This is not the only way in which this can happen. And this gets me to the second uh, counterfactual that we do. Here, what we do is a secondary market intervention. You can think about the first intervention as affecting the banks directly. This one is affecting the securitization market directly. So you can think about QE sort of intervention or reverse QE, if you will. Uh, depends on which side you want to be. Now, what's being plotted here is what that QE or secondary market intervention is going to do to ease of selling the loans or buying the, uh, uh, or how easy it's going to be uh, to sell the loans and at what price. And what's happening here? Well, as you increase, make it more difficult to sell the loans, not surprisingly, if you look at the dotted blue line, banks are going to do a lot more activity on the balance sheet. And of course, as it becomes more and more difficult to sell, that's the only game in town. That's where most of their activity is going to be. But that's going to be a very misleading part of the market again. Why? Because if you look at how much they are selling, there's a big drop there. And here the balance sheet retention margin is going in the opposite direction relative to what we saw before. But more interestingly, what's going to happen is because you're going to hit the secondary part of the market, you're going to see shadow banks contracting quite a bit if it becomes uh, difficult to sell. Again, if you step back and based on what I've told you, this is not surprising. If I hit securitization or selling market, it affects both shadow banks and banks. Whereas the first margin, which was only affecting banks, goes and affects banks. And then the effects show up on shadow banks, mainly through the competitive channel, not directly as, as over here. The other thing to notice here is that this policy uh, is such that shadow banks tend to amplify the uh, aggregate lending shock relative to the previous one where they were dampening the uh, negative shock uh, to the aggregate lending. Why? Because there they were substituting. Here they are basically getting affected exactly like banks. So they are going to be amplifying it. So if you omit shadow banks here, you're going to omit a certain way. And if you omitted it earlier, you're going to omit it in a completely different manner. What that tells you is that this whole idea that you can make policy where we all we need to do when we are thinking about policy responses is to just to scale up in a certain way, what banks are doing may or may not necessarily work depending on what the policy is. And I have some other sort of policies as well, which we discuss in the paper. So let me conclude so that we can have a, a few uh, minutes to uh, discuss more here. Uh, I've tried to document and tell you that two margins are important here, shadow bank migration margin and balance sheet retention margin. If you want to think about how to integrate this in the regulatory framework, what I've argued is not only do you need to understand business model, you need to understand the uh, 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 IO uh, or competition between them and put it in an equilibrium model to be able to study uh, uh, stability, redistribution, and uh, aggregate lending uh, effects. Uh, we have done tried to do that in this uh, paper using a, a, a structural model with uh, heterogeneous consumer demand, and uh, I think this sort of uh, 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 gives three uh, things that I want to end with. One is, like I've already said, so I'm not going to uh, uh, you know, reiterate that, that I think if you want to think about the uh, total view of intermediation and how to do regulation, you've got to think about these margins because otherwise you're going to get responses which are going to be quite, quite different than what you might anticipate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the responses are more nuanced, like I already told you. Uh, if there are shocks directly to bank balance sheet, they work in a certain way. If there are shocks to secondary market, the effects are in a certain way. Measurement, quantitative stuff is going to be very important here. And the last thing which I uh, didn't sort of uh, mention much about, but I will, is that, uh, uh, you know, there are policies that focus on bank stability. They are going to have redistributed implications as well. Uh, because, for example, if you do capital requirements, now that I've given you the entire story, you can see that most of the effect of capital requirements as I jack up the stuff is going to come on the jumbo side eventually. Because as long as GSEs are playing, I still as a bank can redistribute and shadow banks, of course, are going to be fine, more or less. Most of the costs are going to be borne by high income borrowers. But if I do anything to GSE market, there the effects are going to be on the lower income part of the distribution. And how we want to play that 
has a direct effect with how we want to think about bank stability versus uh, any redistribution policy we have. And we can sort of discuss this. The last thing which I started with earlier and I didn't sort of mention is that, like I said, this is all focused on mortgages and in the US market. But a lot of the features that I'm telling you are also relevant for other parts of the market in the US, like uh, uh, you know, personal loan market, student loan market, and outside the US, you know, where you have similar sort of changes happening. And uh, so this uh, paper might be, uh, might uh, produce things which are uh, applicable more, more generally. Uh, but thank you so much for the opportunity and for the silence with which, and patience with which you have heard me. And uh, I, I look forward to uh, getting questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amit. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, let me invite everybody who wants to ask a question uh, live to raise their hand. We have uh, the first uh, question is from Coz John. Coz, I'll unmute you right now. You can go ahead. Uh, Amit, uh, very impressive, very timely, very interesting paper. Uh, so one thing, uh, you know, I sort of one of the punchlines I get from the paper is that when you're thinking of regulating the shadow banking sector, you know, in 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 reality, you should also be thinking about concurrent changes in regulation of the regular banking sector because these things interact. It affects the nature of the competition and things like that. Now, one thing which I've heard a lot of talk about is what would be the differential regulation of the fintech shadow banking sector and the non-fintech shadow banking sector? Because there are some additional issues with respect to the fintech shadow banking, you know, security issues, you know, various other issues. I don't know whether you, you thought about it. Uh, at the same time, I found it very interesting, the exercise that you actually did, which is uh, look at possible changes in uh, you know, really reserve requirements, various aspects of traditional banking as well. Thank you. Th th thanks, Kos. Uh, uh, I, I agree with you that uh, uh, there is uh, lots of differences between non-fintech and fintechs, which people are grappling with. My uh, uh, concern is that the more uh, we dig deeper, the more we might end up not doing anything because there are such uh, important nuances here. Uh, uh, my sense is that like there are some broad frameworks that people are sort of talking about and you're exactly right. As soon as we get into FinTech, we got to think about data, we got to think about privacy. And as soon as we think about big techs, which are also waiting or probably all, already are doing some of, lend, some of the lending, which we don't talk about at all, they get advantage on their e because of their e-commerce and the market side. Uh, which is again data and that has competitive uh, elements to it. So ultimately I think uh, uh, data privacy competition and banking regulation has to be done together with the financial regulators because the general way in which we have thought about regulation, which is financial regulators look at banks, other people look at other things is probably not going to work. Right. So, I totally sympathize with you and agree with you. And, th and thanks, thanks for uh, raising this. Thank you. Thank you, Coase. The next question comes from uh, Jim Angel. I'll unmute you, Jim, you can talk now. Oh, thank you. Uh, really a great paper, very interesting work you're doing here. The, uh, my question is, how does the bank market share vary with the type of product, in particular fixed versus variable rate mortgages? I was always under the impression that uh, banks didn't like interest rate risk, so they were more likely to sell the fixed rate mortgages and hold on to the adjustable rate mortgages. So uh, do you have any data on that and, and how would that affect your model? I, th I think this is a, a very uh, important question. And uh, let me first tell you the uh, uh, fact and then let me speculate. Fact is, uh, in the paper, we don't have uh, ARMs, uh, just because of the nature with which uh, GSEs have released the data, which we need to account for risk characteristics of borrowers and so on. They don't tell you anything about ARMs and so on. Uh, now, one element here, which, is, which makes it okay for the period that we are focused on, is that the ARM share was on the lower side. It was not zero, 
but during the period that we study, it was five, six, seven percent. Part of the reason is because the jumbo market shrunk and the subprime market shrunk. That is where a lot of ARMs were. And there was a big shift towards FRM. But you're absolutely right. Going forward, that's a very important element here. And in the demand side, that should be one of the features because financially constrained borrowers not only just choose between conforming and jumbo, they also worry about ARMs and FRMs and the interest rate exposure they get. And what you mentioned as banks themselves also thinking about my retention versus selling is a function that I want to take interest rate risk or not. So both those things need to be in the model. They are not, but partly because we don't have the data to be able to discipline it. But I do expect going forward ARMs to hopefully come back because ARMs, people usually worry about ARMs rightly that if the rates go up, it's very bad. And if people don't understand, that's a bad thing. But what they forget is during bad times, like right now, when the interest rates are low, we don't need to worry about giving subsidies to the borrowers going through the banks or going through PPP and CARES and so on. You lower the interest rates, you immediately get the stimulus. And that's a pretty important feature of those mortgages, which we sometimes forget. But like I said, I think very pertinent question. I think we are okay for the period we look at, but we should think about it. And it's going to be a more complicated exercise because both demand and supply will be affected based on what you, what, what you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, some, a couple of other questions that came through the chat. The first one is from John Dolan, who's asking whether it is the case that the decline in bank participation in the GSC loans uh, was tied to the litigation cost they had to pay during 2208 to 13 i guess he's referring to the putback policy probably uh so uh, you know uh, uh, what you find is uh, uh, and this is not some so i i just mentioned prior work but in that in that paper we tried to dig deeper into why are banks losing market share i for the purpose of modeling a structural model that's a parameter regulatory costs but if you want to know exactly what it is it it's Probably some of this, but I can't pin it down how much this is. In that paper, what we tried to do is we looked at regulatory costs in different ways. We looked at legal expenses and legal, legal sort of costs. We tried to look at uh, 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 costs of supervision by a tougher regulator than what they were getting regulated by and so on. And we thought that that explained a reasonable chunk of the variation in the data. One other interesting thing, which, you know, uh, otherwise used to be a boring topic, but now with the pandemic uh, has come into forefront, as you might have uh, seen in the newspaper, is servicing rights. Mortgage servicing rights, no one cared about. What are these? These are servicers. Who cares about them? And uh, the thing is that uh, Basel III, back in the day, in 2011-12, made a big change to mortgage servicing rights. It used to be something which didn't have any risk weight associated. So banks were very happy to do that. You know, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a cash uh, flow uh, generating machine for them, especially if it doesn't have any uh, capital requirements with them. But what Basel III did was to impose capital requirements. As a result, banks started doing substantially less in terms of servicing. And a lot of this went to shadow banks. That we can tie in the data very nicely. A lot of variation is sharply associated with mortgage servicing rights uh, getting uh, imposed uh, risk weight under Basel. Uh, but this particular exact feature, I am not able to tie it to, though I think legal costs are definitely important in why banks retreated from many, many areas. Here's the simplest way of knowing this. FHA segment, where there were most amount of risks associated with litigation, banks have completely retreated. There is no other explanation except that banks just don't want to take the risk there. Uh, and shadow banks have just, you know, the only player in town. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you so much. Let me ask you the very last question, um, which you can answer also briefly, given that we are out of time. Um, so what is preventing uh, traditional banks from setting up in some sort of way their own shadow banks? This is the question that comes from JS. So, uh, you know, partly because of uh, uh, regulators in the past financial crisis were worried about this. So a lot of Basel regulation, like this whole mortgage servicing right uh, uh, regulation is trying to plug the loopholes uh, 
in, in, in the entire uh, regulation. So this whole idea that you can set up a shadow bank and then the shadow bank can do your job without regulation <laughs> and you can raise financing is definitely something they thought about. So what they try to do now, I don't know how well they do it, is that if you try to finance a shadow bank uh, as your own entity, then the capital ratio that's going to be put on you is not going to be for any normal loan, but there's a pass-through feature to it. So if it's supposed to be for risky stuff, then your risk weight is going to be accordingly adjusted. That's a fair question, how much we are able to do it in practice. Uh, but, you know, that's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, banks have not gone and set up their own shadow banks as much as they did back in 2006 and 2005. Lots of uh, investment banks, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, everybody had a mortgage shop, as you remember, right? So they, th th that is mm -hmm. what they would try to plug in Dodd-Frank and Basel uh, 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 after the last financial crisis. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. We are out of time. Uh, let me thank Amit for the great paper and great presentation. Uh, and thank, let me thank also the audience for the livelihood. We have many uh, chat questions we man didn't manage to get through. So Amit, I'm going to send it to you via email. Please. And um, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, next week we have Coase John who's going to be presenting a paper titled Bitcoin's Fatal Flaw, The Limited Adoption Problem. So we hope to see you then. And once again, thank you for logging in. Thanks see you later, again. Amit. Thank you, thank you so, much. so much for the opportunity.